Hello, hopefully this is going live. I'm just waiting for the whole tech to fall into place right now. Um, but Kelly and I are here and we are now with you all. Hi, Kelly. Hello, how are you? Good morning and good afternoon, I should say. <laughs> yeah, completely different uh, time zones. So Kelly's going to be sharing it onto her page and we're going to be talking about everything we do as well. But most importantly, we had a conversation, I think it might have been a couple of weeks ago now, just about relationships after having experienced domestic abuse. And Kelly thought it'd be a really good idea to have a conversation about it. So Kelly came up with the idea. She's probably done the, <laughs> the most work in promoting and everything. Um, mm. So thank you, Kelly, for thinking about it. And also I've got to mention that Kelly is a sponsor for Hashtag Abuse Talk as well. So it's always great to do things with sponsors, let everybody know about everybody's work and what they get up to and just to say thank you, really. So Kelly, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody anyway? Yes, I definitely do. Thank you so much. I'm so excited about doing this with you today because I know like dating in general is really difficult to do, but never mind after toxic relationships. So a little bit about me is I had my first book come out, which is Signs in the Rearview Mirror, where I talk about leaving a toxic relationship behind, where it's about how I was abusive in my marriage and then how I was in an abusive relationship after recovering, healing from that whole thing. And then from there, I did become a relationship coach, dating coach, which I'm really excited about. And I am a huge part of this um, hashtag abuse talk because when I first discovered this, I felt like I finally had like people to talk to, people who understood. Because you can have, as you know, like friends and family who see you go through this, but they have no idea what it's really like unless they've been through it. And trying to explain it to somebody really isn't easy to do. So if you've never experienced it, you don't understand it and you're just so confused by it. So um, last week, a lot of times when I, I do join every week, I don't always comment because there are some things that are a little still a little triggering to me and I look and I read and I'm just like oh what's going on here and the one that we talked about a few weeks ago was talking about dating after toxic relationship and I did notice that a lot of people were talking about how they were afraid to do it how mm -hmm. they keep attracting the same type of person how they go out and they they try to date and it doesn't really work out for them very well so they've given up and I feel like it's heartbreaking to hear that because you shouldn't give up because it's not it's not a horrible thing. It's, it's a really, it's a good, happy thing to date and to meet someone and then eventually get into a relationship. But the steps to get to that point, those are very difficult steps to get there. So I know with me, I have my second book coming out, which I do talk about dating after toxic relationship, my own personal experiences, which after my first book came out, I was like, why would I do this? And now I'm doing it again. So it's where I talk about my recovery because recovery after you've been in something so toxic is a huge part of it. It's like that, it's like that bridge going from just being abused into living a healthy life again. And it's mm -hmm. not, it's not always easy to do. So recovery is such a huge part of that. And a lot of people don't realize that we have to recover from these things, whether it's in an abusive relationship that we were in romantically or with parents, siblings, friends, those sorts of things. You don't ever walk out of something like that feeling like, you know, oh, I'm good. I'm good to go. Yeah, it's I mean, I think for me, I, obviously, I've quite open with talking about sort of my healthy relationship and the differences between the two. So mm -hmm. it was really interesting to have that conversation with you and sort of talk about the tools that I'd adapted in my new relationship and, you know, where things have gone wrong and where things have gone right as well. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to say there's some people joining in so feel free to say hi um, and this might probably be the first time that we've done this on Facebook because as you say we're usually on Twitter yes. so, <laughs> but as you say Kelly we've been in contact for maybe even a few years now yeah okay? it's definitely been a few years yeah yeah, yeah because I think oh go ahead sorry no, you're all right. We've both grown in different paths and, and, and we've both shared sort of our experiences together online and personally with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to find out people's different recovery paths is what I would say. 
You know what? It's interesting because I think when you're in like an abusive relationship, it's almost the same. Like I could say to you, these are things that happened to me. And you'd be like, are you living my life? Because the abuse <laughs> in the relationship is usually the same. So, but the thing that's different between everyone is our recovery paths, like what that looks like. So some of us go into a recovery. Some of us just see like a therapist. Some of us don't do anything at all, or we rely on friends and family and that's the biggest thing that is different for each of us is like, and then how we live our lives after something so toxic and something so abusive. And I know for me, I went the recovery route where I got into a recovery actual program. So I was in that up until COVID happened, I was going into meetings and having conversations with a sponsor and, and doing that every single week on top of talking to my therapist as well. So I was able to heal a whole bunch, but while I was healing, I sort of moved away from the area that I lived in, sort of like secluded myself and didn't really do too much and learned who I was again while I was healing. Mm -hmm. But it was during that healing process where I figured out who I was, who I'm not. I was able to kind of learn to live on my own, make decisions on my own, feel much better about stuff. And then I started to date. Yeah, the dating part of it. Um, I thought I thought after recovery, I would be able to come out and just be like, oh, hey, I'm here, I'm perfect. And now I can just like start dating like a normal, healthy human. Yeah, no, I learned um, the hard way that no, that's not how that was gonna go at all. Mm. And, and was- obviously we, you know, I, I just didn't do the dating at all. So <laughs> it was really interesting to hear about your experiences of that and completely understand how difficult you know even though you didn't maybe think it at first how difficult that was going to be Mm -hmm. um having going through your experiences Mm -hmm. um but yeah tell us about maybe the first date then like after that relationship (laughs) I do not (laughs) want to go there (laughs) that first date um was rough because I much like a lot of other people went into dating too soon. I wanted to date because I felt like society says you're not lovable if you're not with someone. So I was like, if the toxic ex is with somebody, then I need to be with somebody. And I forced myself into dating. And the first date was a massive train wreck. And it was, and what it did was when you date too soon, it pushes you right back into the person you're trying to get away from because you feel so uncomfortable and so awkward with the stranger, but you remember feeling comfort to a degree with this person that you knew. So after that first day, I won't go into too many details, but after that first date, I remember sitting on my couch and just crying and crying and crying and trying to get in touch with the ex because I was like, this is a person that I was always comfortable with, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's interesting how we, feel like we want to be comforted by the same person that abuses us because it's what we're used to. Mm. So the first date, it was unhealthy. So I forced myself into a decent amount of unhealthy first dates, Mm. a decent amount of them. And every time I came home, I was, I was like a lot of people, all men are the same is what I decided. They're all the same. They're all terrible. I'll never find somebody, blah, blah. But the thing I didn't realize was in order for me to find a man that was different, I had to heal. I had to become different. I had to become the person I wanted to meet. So I had to be honest and trustworthy. I had to be over my ex. I had to be over all of the relationships I had had in my life before I could meet someone and start something healthy and something more serious, I guess, with like an actual type of person. So And I made goals for myself. I had like a few goals. Like I wanted to do a few things before I started really like dating with intent. Because a lot of times we'll date because we're bored. We'll date because we're lonely. We'll date because there's, you know, nothing else going on or because we just feel like we're supposed to be dating. Um, So I had set goals. And one of my goals before I started dating with intent was to go to Europe, go to Italy. And I did. I did do that. I did do that. So that's a whole situation in itself, but um, more of that will be in my book as well. But I was able to do accomplish this goal that I wanted to do. And then when I got home from that trip, I started dating a little bit, a little bit um, more seriously, 
where it was like um not looking for a relationship but looking to get comfortable with going out and meeting people and learning who I am in like a dating scenario but the thing I didn't realize was while I was single while I was recovering and healing there were so many things I didn't even think that I had to heal from until I started dating Mm. with more intent because you start thinking about the stuff that went wrong in your last relationship that you never really uncovered because you didn't really feel like you had to because it never came up and then it comes up as you're starting to do these things and like walk through life with this and then you're just like like for me to a point I was like am I even ready for this which I, I was but I also needed to get a little bit more of a handle on how to deal with certain things that came up for me, which wasn't super easy at all. And again, something you don't know until you start really doing it with intent. Yeah. And I mean, so I, I would say, though, when I um, hear, hear what you've got to say in your journey, that you kind of did do it the way that I think everybody ends up doing everything going into dating after that kind of relationship you know not doing the recovery not knowing how to recover not even maybe knowing about the full extent of the damage that maybe have been caused and I did everything the wrong way so the wrong way for me is I pretty much went straight into a new relationship Mm -hmm. and thankfully I'm still with him and it's a healthy relationship But if I can sort of just in a nutshell explain that the man who is now my husband was my manager at work. I was separated from my ex, but living under the same roof and trying to work out how we were going to have a life separated, which is obviously impossible when you're with an abuser anyway. Mm -hmm. And this manager at work, we became so close in friends and he recognized um, that there was something wrong in the relationship. Um, or in that situation sorry and I didn't I just thought things were my fault Mm -hmm. and that I had wasn't a good wife wasn't a good person that I failed and it was really hard to struggle through that but he recognized that the behavior was wrong and that the pressures that I was put under to try and find a new place to I was three and a half hours down the road which in England is like a long way (laughs) whereas for you guys it's just down the road but Uh for us it's like the other side of the country so I was away from family and friends and lost those connections and basically my manager at work um, helped by befriending me and he put his name down on a rental property in Hull which is where I live now and my family when they heard about this had warning bells and alarms thinking oh my god you're going to go into another relationship you're vulnerable you know why is he doing this whereas actually if you spoke to my husband now he would say you know I want to say that he fell for me (laughs) I want to say that confidently but I get really like mushy and embarrassed by saying it um but yeah we we ended up in a romantic relationship and I did everything that I would probably be advising everybody else not to do because Mm -hmm. you've got to think of the warning bells (laughs) and everything there but it and but at the same time I think I've spoken quite a bit about the recovery program I was able to access in Hull and I was um, on this program and there was a section on healthy relationships and not just necessarily romantic but in friends in family in anybody that you meet you know Mm -hmm. trying to recognize that healthy aspect and what the personality traits are etc And that was when I realized, oh, my God, maybe I should have really checked to see if uh, he was a good guy or or a bad guy in my head at the time. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but there is uh, the doula wheel, which you can download online for free. And it has the traits of a lot of people seeing the power and control wheel where it gives you all the aspects of an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. But there is also one that doesn't get shared as much, which is the equality one about the healthy relationship and what Mm -hmm. aspects of a relationship would give you the signs that it's healthy. 
And I came across it in this program. And thankfully, when I went through the checkbox, <laughs> you know, it was, you know, ticked or heavily ticked, you know. And so I felt a massive relief. Um, but I do think awareness around that side, around the differences between uh, maybe a healthy relationship and an unhealthy or that kind of person and that those personality traits and what to look out for definitely needs highlighting um, to some extent. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, that's the biggest thing is we're so concerned with talking about what was bad in the relationships. What, what are the signs we look for in an unhealthy, toxic person, but we never ever talk about what do we look for in a healthy person? Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's interesting because like when we do find a healthy person and they have one trait that say they're emotionally unavailable. I -hmm. saw the other day on Instagram and me and I got so heated because it was this psychologist or whatever who said the signs of an emotionally unavailable, and, um, an emotionally unavailable person is abusive, alcoholic, drug addict. And I'm like, wait, why is there so much false information being put out there? Because an emotionally unavailable person, there's nothing wrong with that person. But the second we meet someone and there's one thing wrong with some, see something like that, we automatically think, oh, they're toxic, they're bad, they're this, they're that. And in reality, they're not. There's nothing wrong with the person like that because we never, ever talk about the healthy traits in a relationship we always talk about what to look for to find the bad in someone but what what not to look like for the good like we never yeah. look for the good so it's like you can have you know a person that has all these these great things and a couple of things that are wrong and then your friends and family will be like oh no nope, that person has that one thing wrong they're you know not a good fit for you um and that's a really tough thing because we don't talk about the healthy parts of it and the, the give and take of a relationship where it's like okay, I have a, an idea of what I want and he has, you know, most of it, but he has a little bit of bad. You take the good and, and the bad and then you see if you can like, you know, if this person's like really worth being with, but we never do talk about that. And it's, it's so tough because we don't talk about the recovery as much as we should. We don't talk about what that actually looks like. We don't talk about how that actually feels. We don't talk about how it's almost the same thing as recovering from an addiction mm. where it, you know, it's so, so difficult. I remember getting through my toxic relationship and I could not believe how absolutely painful and difficult it was and to put one foot in front of the other and then to have a life that I have today where I'm happy and healthy and thriving and, you know, met a good person and all this stuff. I never imagined myself living this life because of how horrible that recovery was. And I can see why people don't want to do the recovery aspect of it because it's so difficult because it's basically looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, how did I end up here? Mm -hmm. What decisions did I make that led me to this? And we have accountability in being in a relation, relationship like this. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, oh, that guy or that woman was terrible. You're perfect. You didn't deserve any of that. You're perfect. Well, literally we're not perfect. And we did make decisions to stay too long or get into something. And, and it is obviously, as we both know, how difficult it is to actually get out. Um, mm -hmm. But at, when we do get out, when we are out and we are safe. And I think a lot of friends and family do think that because your suitcases are on the other side of the door, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And now they want you to come back to being normal and they want you to be you know, who you were before that relationship. And then they want you to date and how can you not find somebody? And, you know, how come you're not coming to this party? And the thing I'd like to use the analogy with is if you've had heart surgery and you come out of the hospital, are yeah. you healed? You know, no, you're not healed. You still have this long recovery to go before you can even start getting up and walking, but because they can't see it on the outside of your body, they think you're fine. Mm. And, that's and I think, you know, talk, talking about that aspect as well, um, it makes you look at, you know, our journeys individually and how, you know, we've, you know, I would say I've struggled through it. You know, it's, it's really yeah. not an easy process, but yeah. without doing that, I wouldn't have mentally been free from it. And mm -hmm. as you say, talking about the recovery process and looking at ways moving forward, I can always talk about what happened to me and mm. the more I move forward, the more I talk about actually, you know, how happy I am now. And, and mm. actually that everybody deserves this kind of happiness, um, whether that's you making a decision to be on your own or making a decision to find somebody else. As mm. long as you are happy within yourself and are able to 
um, you know, have the tools in place to handle triggers and to be able to walk, you know, the next part of your life mm -hmm. without the abuser's voice in the back of your head. And for me, I think I've took, talked quite a lot on my blog, for example, about the difficulties that I've had with my new husband. It's not been perfect. Um, you know, a lot of people say they want to be in where I am in my journey, but it's, it's still not easy. There are parts, there are times where, you know, it's like, stay away from me for now because I'm having a hard time. You know, I still get flashbacks and triggers. The difference is they're fa the farther apart and they're mm. not as big. But if mm. I, or sometimes it's like they're so far apart, then I have a massive one. It's really just depends on you as a person. But what I am glad of is the awareness that we can bring to recover to put things into place to help us so that we feel more in control and mm. the difficulty with being in an abusive relationship is that you're not in control and then when you're out of that relationship and you're looking for a path I sought people to give make decisions for me so mm. I wasn't ready to be in control <laughs> now I'm completely fine um sometimes I say um to my husband Rob I say look um what do you want for tea and he's like I don't know I'm like right just because you said I don't know I can't make a decision because I need sometimes I need the ability to share that responsibility and mm -hmm. it's so important to work on the team aspect of it yes but I don't know how um I know you're in a new relationship Mm -hmm. um and you know so how how's that going because you're you're quite a few years out of your abusive relationship now mm -hmm. so do you feel like you know you're equipped or do you feel like you're learning things as you go how do you feel <laughs> I'm definitely learning as I go I'm definitely learning as I go and it's interesting because I know like people have a hard time getting into relationships after something like this and, it, and it's it's scary because it, it's exciting at first. So for me, like when I met this person, I did something different I had never done before, which was, I was super honest, honest, because I was like, you know what? This person's not gonna stay. It doesn't matter. I'm gonna be exactly who I am and we'll just see how it goes. No expectations. Um, and the third date I showed up in sweatpants <laughs> because I was like, why not? Yeah, like he's not going to stay. I like these sweatpants. They're great. They're comfortable. And I'm just going to kind of go and just, and just do whatever. And it, I have to say, like, it was, um, it was amazing doing that honesty thing because I, would, I felt like free enough and secure enough that if this person didn't want to stay, then he didn't need to. And I was going to be just fine. And it was on to the next, you know, keep, keep kind of dating, kind of doing that. But when I met him, it was interesting because my, uh, therapist was like it's it's time to like start dating and I was like why do we have to do this and he's like it's just it's time for you to get out there and you know meet people and learn to say no learn what you like what you don't like learn who you are and your dating aspect and the one thing that kept me away from dating for so long while I was recovering I had this fear because I was the abuser in my marriage and I had this fear that if I met someone I was going to go back to that that I was going to go back to being massively controlling and a name caller and just a horrible, a, as we all know what an abuser is, I was afraid to go back to that. So I spent a lot of time in my recovery ensuring mm. that I wasn't going to be that person again. So when it was time to date again, it scared the hell out of me. And I was yeah. like, what if I do this? What if I go back to this person? I don't, I didn't like that person. I didn't like that woman that I was. I wanted to be someone different. So I didn't know who I was going to be when I did meet someone. So when I started dating healthy, I started realizing, okay, I can say no to this person. I can say no to that person. The first time I went out with somebody um, and he seemed to be, he was, he was a nice guy, whatever, he was good looking, um, but he kept making like impressions the whole date, the whole right. date, all impressions. And I'm like, this is absolutely painful to be with this person right now and then he asked me on a second date and I was like let me just try it again and see what happens you know it was worse so he eventually you know said to me he's like so I'm feeling like you just want to be friends and for the first time in my life I was like yes I'm not interested in you I would rather just be friends 
and never heard from him again, which was great. But I was so proud of myself because I didn't stay with somebody and be living a life where he was just making constant impressions all the time, driving me batty. So it was interesting for me to learn how to say no, to learn how to say I'm not interested, to learn how to say no, thank you, I'm going to move on. So when I met the person that I'm dating now, um, just side note, he's like incredible, like absolutely incredible. He's a great guy. He's um, ev uh, everything that you would want in a guy. I mean, he's like literally the biggest pain in the ass, but he's incredible. So, and he's worth me going through this. And th by dating him, he taught me that I was using my toxic relationship as a crutch to not like move on with my life. And I don't really know how much of that he knows that he, he taught me, but he's also teaching me that like when I have problems with being jealous or being upset about something that I have to deal with that on my own, that that's not something somebody else can come in and fix. So I'm learning how to do things on my own and learning how to continue being the person that I want to be. And I'm growing, I've grown so much since I've met him that it's, it's amazing. And I'm having a, a great time with it. And of course, it's like you said, it's like, you're going to have flashbacks. You're going to have triggers. You're going to have these different things that kind of happen. And me learning to not associate those things with this new thing mm -hmm. um, was a bit difficult at first, but now it's like, let me handle this aspect of it and then get on with this. So it doesn't come in between and like interfere. Cause a lot of it is stuff that I still have to work on myself. Um, he's great. Cause he'll listen to me. He's, you know, open-minded. He doesn't fully understand it but tries as best as he can. And I do appreciate that. So it's, um, it's definitely been interesting to do that. And the whole, in my, in my book, I, in my second book, I do write about the first like year of how this goes and like the things that a, a, an abused person will go through in their first healthy relationship and what it was like for me. So I had a few things that I pointed out that were really difficult for me that I struggled with and wrote about it because I know if I'm struggling with it, a lot of other people are struggling with it as well and mm -hmm. how I would be able to kind of handle it and like get through it. And there are definitely times where um, you know, I just freak out in my own mind. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then I do think sometimes like, am I ready for this? Am I not ready for this? Like, how come I'm not like perfect? How come I'm not, you know, how come I'm not finding this with such ease? So it's been definitely um, an interesting sort of thing for me, definitely. But it's been great as well. I think though, like, you know, we're all filled with um, fantasy from such an early age as well. So mm. we're grown up with, you know, movies that are really not realistic and the perfect life that you should have and the perfect marriage and the perfect romantic scenario. Mm. And that's just not how it goes. I mean, um, Rob didn't even propose to me. Uh, we were actually, I was having... Um, our stillborn baby at the time and I said I he got down on one <laughs> don't worry we can talk about it um he got down on one knee but it was actually because there was no chair there for him to sit on so he, he was just holding my hand and he was too he was a bit tired he didn't want to stand up anymore and I was drugged up and I thought he was proposing to me and he had to take it seriously after that because I said why don't we just do it even though we're both set against it to be honest um, and the other thing that I picked up um, from from what you were saying is, you know, you managed to have that control to be able to say, you know, that's not right for me. Um, mm -hmm. So that shows so much. And mm -hmm. I was talking to you about um, safe words <laughs> and yes. I was telling you and I don't mind talking about it because I, I'm talking about a safe word, what that uh, me and my husband have for, you know, not just intimacy, but for conversations, for arguments, for anything, so that yeah. it, give, it gives me the reassurance that I'm able to stop anything at any moment, whatever it mm -hmm. may be. And in the earlier days, it was actually more about um, conversations to do with my ex. And mm -hmm. he, life, um, domestic abuse doesn't end when the relationship does. You still deal with that person for a long time, you know. And so we had to have conversations on how we moved forward. And sometimes I was just exhausted. Um, and I told you and the whole world knows anyway, because it's printed in a book that just came out last week. Um, but our word is banana. And I will say, I just don't want that banana split or I don't want the banana smoothie. And it gives me 
the ability to feel in control and I suppose that's where it gives me that reassurance in our relationship and it's my responsibility to pick it up so if I declare the word banana <laughs> then I have to pick it up if it if that's an hour if that's the same day if it's a week I have to carry that conversation you know on when we where we, where we left it but I've mm -hmm. got to be ready and uh, that helps me with my mindset and mm -hmm. just to reassure everyone it's not just me that uses it you know my husband will use it as well if he's sick of hearing about um you know my, my experiences of domestic abuse or mm -hmm. we're, we're about to have an argument about something which is very rare he will use it um or tickling and i know that's a bit bad i do like to give him a tickle and uh, i try not to push my luck <laughs> but <laughs> But it's that for, for me, everything to do with, um, you know, those healthy relationships. If you are able to create boundaries and feel that you are a part of a team and have that element of um, balance in control and sharing that equality, then mm. that is you, you're you're on the right path, aren't you? Yeah, I definitely think so. And I think it's um, it's it's tough because recovering from something like this and then getting to a relationship is like is um, difficult in itself, but then you also have the real actual relationship stuff that you have to deal with. <laughs> so it's trying to like, you know, mix the two and uh, for the most part, a lot of people are going into it with just dealing with the relationship stuff, but then you have the other aspects, like the control thing is a really interesting kind of point because we have two types of control after an abusive relationship where it's like, you know, we want to take control of ourselves and make sure that we're okay and we can say no and we can say yes and we can do the things that we want to do but then there's another point of it where it's like after the, with the dating in a sense I found myself trying to control the direction of the relationship because yeah. I'm trying to do prevention I'm trying to and I just realized <laughs> this like recently like that I'm trying to prevent certain things from happening and if I can control the relationship and the way it goes then I, I won't get hurt um no surprise like regardless there's going to be hurt at some point. So I had to let go of that control and I had to decide, okay, I'm just going to let this go and it's just going to happen. And I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm sure he thinks the same thing and it's just let it go and, and see exactly what happens. So it's interesting how like you want to have the control over yourself and the things that you are allowed, allowing yourself to do and not do, but then you also, but then at the same time, you don't want to try to control aspects of the relationship. And like yeah. the way that it kind of goes, because you don't want to, you don't want, nobody wants to get hurt. And the thing that I want to let, to let people know is that if you do get into a relationship after your toxic relationship and it ends, it's not going to hurt as much as the toxic relationship hurts. And mm -hmm. that's the thing I think a lot of people kind of go back to, and I did the same thing myself where it's like, I don't want to hurt like that again. So I'm not going to get like get involved with somebody but that type of hurt is not going to happen again because that happened it's over and it's never going to be ground zero is what mm -hmm. like I call it like it's never going to be that ever again it's going to be a completely different kind of hurt and it's where you have to learn to trust yourself before you can get into anything before you can start doing this trust yourself trust your instincts like mm -hmm. for such a long time we were so manipulated with our emotions and our feelings that we even if our bodies were telling us something, we couldn't pay attention to it because we we're so busy juggling the abuse and everything else that was going on that we had no idea what our bodies were doing. And now when you get away from it, when you heal from it, you're able to like sit quietly and listen to your body. Mm -hmm. And I think coming out of something so toxic is like the same thing as like, probably not the best analogy, but it's like a bride planning a wedding for a few years or whatever. And then the day after the wedding, there's nothing left to do and you feel empty. Yeah. And you just feel like, oh my gosh, I should be doing something. And with the amount of craziness this toxic relationship brings into your life, you sit there and you're like, okay, now what do I do? And you have all this free time and you don't know what to do. And then of course you start overthinking, which is... Yeah, well, I was just going to come to that point and say about the overthinking, because clearly that's, um, you know, sometimes where I would say you might fall down that path. Uh, we've had those kind of conversations. And to be honest, I think it's completely normal. I fall into that path. And I think it's because we're trained um, from our ex to read in between the lines. We are trained to know what that look that that person gives means we are trained 
to understand that if they say something it doesn't mean that at all it has a completely different message and that is really really difficult to move forward when we're trying to overcome a habit mm-hmm. that's been embedded in us for months years and so it is really important to try and not overthink it as well because we we fall into that path of treating it almost like we're back there and I think that's one of the biggest um, things that, you know, I feel so bad for. I mean, Rob has been there right at the beginning of my recovery and Mm -hmm. throughout to now. He would tell you that I am a completely different person in confidence and in in the in the way I am. He's he's watched me on this journey. And Mm -hmm. in the beginning, he had to deal with my paranoia and Mm -hmm. all the different things that comes with that early stage, you know. I, I admittedly told him that I checked his phone because I believed that he was up to no good because mm-hmm. I was told that that's what was going to happen that I, and I, that I didn't feel worth you know anything else so yeah. you know it was it's really difficult um but I do want to talk about is you know your work and also um a bit about you know the book that has just come out last week it's not mine but I want to talk about that as well mm-hmm. so you tell us um, about the um, publications that you have um, because it's I think it's really important for people to know I've personally read them I've mentioned it before um, mm. and it, you know I always think raising awareness in this way by telling such raw honest stories really yeah. helps bring well just an, a different level of understanding yeah I think it really does and I think it's um it's crazy brave when people do stuff like this and they really open it up. And I do sometimes question why I would (laughs) put my actual name and picture on the book. Um, I've definitely gotten a lot of mixed messages from it, but the first one that I have is signs in the rearview mirror. So that's basically, I started writing this because of the toxic relationship I was in. I remember at one point in the recovery process, being in the shower for a very long time and just letting the water hit me. And then crawling out of the shower and laying on my closet floor and crying and not being able to get up. Like, this is how bad it is. And people don't understand, but it's like laying in. I remember the one thing I thought to myself was, if I get out of this, if I survive this, because I thought I was the only one in the whole world that had gone through this. And I remember like talking to God and being like, why me? Why is it me? Why am I the one that has to experience this? But I remember thinking, if I do get out of this, I'm going to write this and I'm going to try to help so no one else goes through this ever again. And then one foot in front of the other, months and years later, when I was able to finally do what I did, I started writing my my story. And then it was interesting because I started writing my story about the toxic relationship, which then made me realize I was the abuser in my marriage, which then made me realize my mom was the abuser in her marriage. And then I was like, and I went to my therapist and I was like, hey, by the way, I think my mom's narcissistic. And he's like, oh my God, finally you realize this. So he knew this for years. I had no idea. Um, So then my, so when I released the book, it was, it seems to be doing fairly well. People seem to really like it because a lot of people, this is a book written in the perspective um, of my own personal story, but also in a way where somebody who had never been in a toxic relationship can understand why it's difficult to leave, why you can't just like pack your stuff and go, why you can't leave and then go to the zoo with your friends and have a fun time. It's written for the person that's in the relationship, for the person that is the abuser and the people around them to try to help them figure out like, okay, why is this happening? I don't understand this. So I've had a few people who were like, I've never experienced toxic relationship, but I feel like I have now and I understand so much more. So with that one, um, I read a little bit about my recovery and then my relationship with my ex-husband and, and the hottest part in that book for me to write was what this toxic relationship did to my kids because we tend to forget that these kids see and hear everything. And then after this relationship, I have three boys and my three boys, my oldest one especially watched me abuse his dad, F- not physically, just mentally, well, not just mentally, but And then he ended up in an abusive relationship, verbally abusive relationship with a girl. And I was like, oh my God, this, I taught him that this was okay. Mm -hmm. So that finally ended. And now he's, you know, much, much different now, but 
these are the things that you don't really realize that you're doing. Like when you're in something like this, you're teaching your kids that this is okay. You're yeah. teaching them that it's okay to stay in something. And it's okay to be talked to like this, that, that it's okay. And you stay in a lot of people like to say, but I love him. You don't, I'm sorry to tell you that you don't love him. There's no love there. It's an addiction. It's comfort. It's other things. It's just absolute love is amazing. Oh my gosh, love is the most amazing thing in the entire world. <laughs> love has hurt not one single person. Love is beautiful. I love it. Um, so I, after this book came out, it seemed to do pretty well. And I just wrote, I wrote my second book, which is going to be published coming up here soon. Um, no title yet. Um, but that one is more about more in depth about the recovery process. And then it's the unhealthy dating. So <laughs> I'm sorry to the people that I've dated here in this book. Um, everyone's kind of hidden. And then it's my you know, trip to Europe and what that was like, and then healthy dating, and then finally meeting the person that I'm dating now and like what that was like. So it's basically, it's not about, you know, the, the men or anything like that. It's basically about the path I took and how it was and like how I handled pretty much everything and how it's all going. But then I am working on a, on a fiction book right now, which I'm super psyched about. Wow, it sounds like you've got loads like happening, and I, you know, I'd be, I'm quite, I can't wait to hear about this second book. So mm -hmm. I believe you've been putting chapters up on your website, or is that a completely different thing? Yeah, that's my, um, that's my weekly blog series, my my fiction series. Oh, it's a good one because yeah, this character um, leaves a good relationship and gets into something horrible, and it's interesting how it kind of came out that way. But I'm excited about that one. If you haven't read it um you'll have to check it out and let me know what you think um definitely but, and we'll pop um we'll pop the information below so everyone can you know check it out and everything um i've i and i've i think i wrote a review ages ago so i'll have to probably dig that out and share it with everyone yeah, um so but um just for everybody that doesn't know kelly smith um is an author and she's also a relationship coach and most importantly of course she's a sponsor for hashtag abuse talk so without her hashtag abuse talk wouldn't be able to run in the same way um if you haven't heard about hashtag abuse talk it started with a weekly twitter chat which we just use as a platform to discuss domestic abuse and we don't just cover I don't want to say the negative parts of discussion on domestic abuse, but we also cover the recovery. We have like socials. We, we do all sorts really on, the, on that platform. I've done all kinds of different things um, and it's grown. We've got a forum um, which is temporarily closed, awaiting the grand opening of the website on the 27th of May. So do check that out. There's an event on the Facebook page. And there's a podcast as well, which Kelly has featured in. So that is what Hashtag Abuse Talk does. And the book that I was referencing and the anecdotes, it isn't my book, but I, since we're talking about recovery and it's kind of fallen into place, this is the book that has just come out. Um, can you see it? Um, yeah, it's called The Recovery Toolkit. It's written by Sue Penner and it is a self-help book. It's the program that I went on originally and that's where I decided I was going to write my story and bring awareness to domestic abuse. And as you can see, it's a self-help book. But the most exciting part, obviously, for me is that these grey boxes, they're my anecdotes on how I went through the programme. And most importantly, as we're talking about relationships, it covers relationships and it came out just last week. So I would be interested to hear what you think of it, Kelly, actually. So yeah. I will get in touch with you about it because it is um, something that changed my life, that programme. So I'm honoured to be a part of it. I really feel quite a heavy burden of responsibility to be involved in such a book. <laughs> but I talk about, um, you know, the tools that I adapted in, in my recovery through that. So I was really just... I just feel really great about that project, actually. <laughs> so that's, that's just um, what I wanted to mention today anyway. But for anybody that wants to get in touch with you, Kelly, um, about your experiences, obviously er for everybody, we've been quite open with our experiences. We haven't really had to hold anything back. I'm not really <laughs> bothered anymore. My, my husband's given me permission as well to talk about whatever I want. <laughs> so, that's how we Phew. <laughs> um, so 
um, do get in touch with us or get in touch through the Facebook pages, email or anything, especially if some of what we've said has maybe triggered any memories or thoughts and you may need e extra support. Um, I don't know if you know any of the helplines over in the US, Kelly, or if you're able to get in touch with people um, mm -hmm. and direct them, but that's generally what I do in the UK is I help find a local support service. And one of our other sponsors is offering free online counselling at the moment um, because of lockdown. So that might also be an option if anybody feels that they need that support. Mm -hmm. So, um, but do talk to Kelly because you do have a side that we haven't even really touched on, which is the relationship coaching. Mm -hmm. Do you want to briefly talk about that before we close? Oh, yeah, I think, I think the relationship coaching is, is so much fun because I, I work with a lot of people that, are, that have left toxic relationships and kind of help them to leave those relationships behind and then start the dating process again. So I'm, I'm really excited because I'm going to school now. I'm certified right now. I'm getting accredited for um, my coaching. And then in July... I'm going to be launching um, like a seminar, online seminar. I'm calling it Dating 101, where you can learn if you've been out of a, out of a long-term relationship and you want to get back into dating, where it's going to be a, like a process on teaching you how to either use the apps, how to meet people, how to talk to people, questions to ask, to find out, you know, who they really are, that sort of thing, kind of getting them back in. Um, and then I'm going, try, I'm going to try that one as like a little tester and then do a relationship one and then do one about leaving toxic relationships and dating after a toxic relationship specifically, because that is, it's, it's, as we know, it's extremely difficult to do and to feel like a whole person again and feel like worthy enough to be trying to get into a relationship with somebody. Um, but on my website, Kelly Smith coaching, you can find all the information about getting in touch with me, working with me, that sort of thing. I do offer a 25 minute consultation for free to see if we're a good fit. Um, and then prices vary from there, but it's um, definitely something that I really like doing. I have a great time with it. Um, I love getting to know people and guiding them and helping them. And I love seeing the clients grow from, you know, leaving something behind all the way into dating. So I think that's, it's such an amazing process to see people happy again and to see people smiling again and to see people away from something that's been so terrible, but they're healing and you know, we have a different, I have a few different steps that I put people through after the toxic relationship that gets them to a point where they can start considering dating again. So mm -hmm. it's a huge passion of mine to help people get through this and to help people get on with their lives. Because when I was miserable, I didn't think I would ever be happy. And now today I don't know that I could be more happy. And it's such <laughs> a good, great feeling. That's awesome. Right. I do have some questions. I've got Julie, uh, she's asking, what's your book called? And it's Smith, by the way, Julie, S-M-I-T-H. What's your book called again, Kelly? Signs in the Rearview Mirror, Leaving a Toxic Relationship Behind. That's great. And we've also had, I'm just seeing if we've got any more questions. If anybody did want to pop some on, you know, pop them with. I have got, just to let everyone know, I've got this video playing in like Four different locations so now I'm looking through because I realize people have asked questions um Julie has also asked how do you meet another man I'm so scared but would love a companion I don't know if you mm. want to answer that or if you want to answer it personally to her after Kelly what do you think well I think meeting another meeting a man is is where you um it's where you are with yourself like how do you feel about being in a relationship again how do you like what kind of recovery how long have you been single you know that sort of thing but I would I would be more than happy to talk to her one-on-one -on -one and kind of give her some advice absolutely um so if I could get her information I think that would be great I'd love to give her a consultation and we can kind of discuss things for a little bit and see where she is and see what she's been doing what's working and what's not working I would love to help her that's fab um we've also had I'm going to try and um pronounce the name right here James Valentine has joined in um, just to say hi and that from a male perspective. We've also had Linda joining in from Perth in Western Australia, which is nice. lovely. And we've had a couple of people, Sharon and Samantha joining in and loads of people sort of reacting and coming in and out, which is lovely. Um, Jenny Perdue as well. I've got like three different places I've played this. So I, hope, <laughs> I hope it's been of some use. Um, what I'll do after this video is we'll pop Kelly's information 
um, in the comments below wherever you're watching and also I'll pop the information to the recovery toolkit if anybody's interested and obviously um, remember that on the 27th of May is the grand opening of the hashtag abuse talk website which I'm very excited about okay. um, yeah I need to message you a bit more about that as well Kelly yeah. um, but we just well Kelly decided to do this and then I kind of took over and then we've both kind of shared it haven't we so it's been quite random and quite nice to do and hopefully we'll do it again in the future yeah I think it was great I think it's having two different perspectives like I was doing the dating you did the relationship and I think that kind of helps to give people like an idea of like what things can be and, and regardless of which road you take that it, it can work out if you find a partner that's willing to like work with you and to understand you I think that's the biggest key yeah definitely well thank you so much thank and you. hopefully we'll see everybody online in the near future <laughs> that sounds great thank you so much